In the last lesson, we learned that arguments on the GMAT typically consist of premises, unstated assumptions, and conclusions. Now, when tackling critical reasoning questions, it's very important to be able to identify these components in each argument. So in this lesson, we'll practice dissecting arguments by identifying and summarizing the premises, conclusion, and any unstated assumptions. We'll begin with this argument. Every hockey fan I know is nice. I do not know Judy, but since she is wearing a hockey jersey, she must be nice. Now at this point, you may want to pause the video and take a moment to summarize the conclusion, premises, and any unstated assumptions before continuing. Now since the purpose of any argument is to convince the reader of a particular conclusion, you should always give the conclusion your greatest attention. So as you read each piece of any argument, you should ask yourself, is this what the author is trying to convince me of? Now in this argument, we find the conclusion at the end. The author is trying to convince us that Judy must be nice. So we might summarize this conclusion as follows. Now, of course, throughout these exercises, your summaries will often look different from mine, and that's okay. Your goal should be to use as few words as possible to summarize the argument. All that matters is that you can understand your summaries later on. Okay, now that we have identified the conclusion, what evidence does the author use to support that conclusion? These will be the premises. Well, one premise can be found here. Every hockey fan I know is nice. We might summarize this premise as follows. Another premise used in this argument is here. I do not know Judy. We might summarize this as follows. The last premise in the argument is here, which basically tells us that Judy is wearing a hockey jersey, which we might summarize like this. Okay, now that we've summarized the given information, we should never have to return to the original argument since all of the necessary information is contained within our summary. All right, now before we go looking for assumptions, let's examine what we have so far. Does this seem like a very strong argument? In other words, how well does the conclusion follow from the premises? Well, like most arguments on the GMAT, this argument is most certainly not perfect. Sure, it's possible that Judy is nice, but it's also quite possible that she is not. As you can see, the author has made a pretty big leap from the given premises to the conclusion. This leap consists of several unstated assumptions that the author has made. Let's see if we can identify some of those assumptions. Now remember that an assumption is an unstated premise that is absolutely necessary in order for the conclusion to be drawn. Well, one necessary assumption is that the hockey fans I know are representative of all hockey fans out there. Another required assumption is that wearing a hockey jersey makes a person a hockey fan. Now there are several more unstated assumptions necessary for the conclusion to follow here, but our goal is not to find all of them. Our goal at the moment is to simply get a feel for finding assumptions. So to that end, let's dissect another argument. Here a researcher tells us that two years ago a wolf pack was relocated to Belford Island. Although the local rabbit population has decreased drastically since the relocation, the wolves are not to blame for this decrease. Our study shows that the unprecedented number of recent rabbit deaths is due to the Maxoma virus. Once again, you may wish to pause the video and summarize the conclusion premises and assumptions before continuing. Okay, let's begin with the conclusion. What is the author trying to convince us of in this argument? Well, some students will say that the conclusion is here. The wolves are not to blame for the decrease in the rabbit population. And other students will say that the conclusion is here. The decrease in the rabbit population is caused by the virus. So which one is it? Well, in situations where it's difficult to locate the conclusion, you can always apply the premise therefore conclusion test. To apply this test, we examine the two different arrangements possible and see which one makes the most sense. When we do this, we get option A, the wolves are not to blame, therefore the virus caused the deaths, and we get option B, the virus caused the deaths, therefore the wolves are not to blame. Well, as you can see, option B makes more sense. So the conclusion here is that the wolves are not to blame, and the virus information is a premise that supports the conclusion. So to summarize the conclusion, we might write something like this. All right, now let's summarize the premises. 
First, we can take this part about the wolf relocation and summarize it as follows. Next, we can summarize this information like this. And finally, this last part can be summarized as follows. So this is the basic structure of the argument. Now can you identify any assumptions that are necessary to draw the conclusion? Well, for this argument, it might be difficult to spot a necessary assumption, and that's okay. Although it's useful to identify unstated assumptions, you should not spend too much time looking for them. Nevertheless, let's see if we can find one. Well, we're told that the virus caused the deaths, but from this, can we naturally conclude that the wolves are not to blame? Not really. Perhaps the wolves brought the virus to the island, or perhaps the wolves' actions have caused the virus to flourish. In these cases, the wolves would be partially responsible. So an unstated assumption might be that the wolves did not somehow contribute to the existence of the virus on the island. This would be an assumption that is necessary for the conclusion to follow from the premises. Okay, so that's that argument. Now before we examine the next argument, let's look at a few tips to consider when identifying conclusions and assumptions. First, when looking for the conclusion of an argument, you should be aware of certain trigger words that indicate the presence of a conclusion. For example, therefore is a very common keyword, but there are several more to watch out for. Now you should also watch out for keywords that indicate the presence of a premise. These include the following keywords. Also, when looking for the conclusion of an argument, it helps to know the most common argument structures. Now the most common structure looks like this, where the conclusion appears at the very end of the passage, after the supporting premises. Another common structure is one where the conclusion appears at the beginning of a passage, and then the supporting premises appear afterwards. Now given these two popular structures, you should pay extra attention to the first and last sentences of a passage, since the conclusion could be hiding there. Finally, there are times when the main passage does not contain a conclusion at all. Instead, the conclusion appears in the question stem itself. We'll examine this structure shortly. Before we do that, however, please note that these three structures are the most common structures. There are, of course, times when the conclusion appears somewhere in the middle of the passage, so watch out for that as well. It's also important to note that there are times when the passage does not contain a conclusion at all. For example, some critical reasoning questions provide you with premises only, and you must select a reasonable conclusion from the answer choices. We'll examine this question type later on. Okay, now let's examine one last argument. It says, until recently, the only species living in Chilliwack Lake was the gigafish. Last month, however, several softca fish were spotted in the lake. Unlike gigafish, softca fish do not eat insects. Instead, they survive by eating other fish. In other lakes where softca fish exist, their populations are limited by dragonfish, which like to feed on the softca fish. Which of the following, if true, most effectively challenges the conclusion that releasing 100 dragonfish into Chilliwack Lake will allow the gigafish in Chilliwack Lake to survive? Now you may wish to pause the video now so that you can summarize the various components of this argument. Now as you can see, there is no conclusion in the main passage here. Instead, the conclusion can be found here in the question stem. The conclusion is that releasing 100 dragonfish into Chilliwack Lake will allow the gigafish to survive. So here's one way to summarize this conclusion. Okay, now let's look for supporting evidence. First we have this part where we are told that the gigafish used to be the only fish species in Chilliwack Lake. We can summarize that here. Next we're told that softca fish were found in the lake last month, so we can summarize this as follows. Then we're told that softca fish survive by eating other fish, so we can summarize this this way. And finally, we're told that in other lakes, dragonfish limit the softca fish population by eating them. So one way to summarize this is as follows. So the basic structure of the argument looks something like this. Now can you think of any unstated assumptions that are necessary for the conclusion to follow from the premises? Well, it seems that one big assumption is that the dragonfish will not eat the gigafish. 
Without this assumption, it's possible that the gigafish population could still disappear from the lake. Now we're also assuming that the dragonfish will not do something else to jeopardize the gigafish. Another assumption is that 100 dragonfish will be sufficient to limit the softcafish population. Now it's possible that there are many more assumptions, but instead of looking for them, I'll add an extra word of caution about assumptions. When it comes to deconstructing an argument, identifying assumptions is usually the hardest step, and if you get too caught up in this step, you can waste considerable time. Also note that there are many critical reasoning questions where identifying the assumptions will not even help you answer the question. So although it's nice to identify the underlying assumptions in an argument, this step is not entirely crucial. In almost all cases, you will still be able to answer the question, however, it may take a little longer if you have not identified any underlying assumptions. So I'll leave you with this. As you deconstruct and summarize an argument, be sure to watch out for any unstated assumptions, but do not let this slow you down to the point where it becomes detrimental to your timing. Okay, let's summarize. In this lesson, we learned some tips to help us deconstruct arguments on the GMAT.